they don't allow us to look at a lot of the different properties of the brain that newer or sophisticated MRI imaging or PET imaging allow us to look at. Like, for example, with newer MRI imaging, we can look at the uh, cables that connect different parts of the brain to one another. They're like internet cables or phone cables. And you can see whether or not these cables are disrupted or torn in some ways. And you can't see that with x-ray. Or you can look at things like uh, the ability to measure very small parts of the brain uh, with very high precision and accuracy. Areas of brain that involve with things like emotional regulation, like the amygdala. And you can't do that kind of thing with x-ray. Or you can look at things like the ability to measure how much sugar is being consumed in different parts of the brain. Sugar is a main fuel for the brain. And so we can use sugar consumption in different parts of the brain to determine if there are abnormal patterns consistent with histories of brain injuries. We know that x-rays are generally very insensitive for detection of most traumatic brain injuries, whereas these newer, more sophisticated MRI or PET imaging are much more accurate and better. Okay. Yeah. Could I interrupt for a minute? If you guys are witness to slow down a little bit, oh, I, he, he's clearly very familiar with this field, but the rest of us are not. Yes, sir. And for the jury and for the court reporter and the chair, it would be easier. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I'm not going to have to be sorry, but if you could just slow down. I'll, I'll do my best. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And Dr. Wu, um, you've mentioned the MRI and the PET scan. Um, are those the most advanced uh, machines, so to speak, for looking at the brain? Well, the MRI has many different capabilities, and so the capabilities that I'll be discussing with the MRI involve some of the newer, more advanced, what we call sequences or capabilities, including uh, diffusion tensor imaging, or uh, the ability to measure white matter high bone densities. And so these are all uh, newer, more advanced uh, imaging capabilities that uh, are not uh, oftentimes used in your average uh, uh, hospital. Okay, and are the MRI machines more advanced than, say, an EEG? Yes, and uh, an uh, EEG, conventional EEG is like a, a caveman technology I mean, compared to the ability to look at some of the more sophisticated properties that we can now look at with MRIs. Okay, so we're, we're using the best equipment we, we have, right? Yes. Okay, and if you would, would turn to the first screen on your PowerPoint, um, talk to us about what you're going to do today. So I'm going to talk about four different types of imaging. The first three will deal with MRIs. The first type of uh, MRI imaging I'm talking about will be MRI quantitative biometrics, or QV for short. And that's the ability to measure the different volumes of the brain, like the uh, hippocampus or the amygdala, with very high precision and accuracy to see if there are abnormalities in how large or small different structures of the brain are. <coughs> the second type of MRI imaging I'll be talking about will be something called white matter hypointensity, or WMH for short. And white matter hypointensities are abnormalities that show up in the MRI, which are a reflection of things such as maternal uh, infections during uh, uh, pregnancy, which can cause a malformation of the wiring of the brain. And the third type of MRI imaging I'll be talking about is diffusion tensor imaging, or DTI. And DTI looks at the ability to be able to measure the uh, cables uh, that connect different parts of the brain to one another, like the white kind of cables that connect the right side of the brain to the left side, the front to the back. And so I'll be talking about three different types of MRI, the quantitative biometrics, the white matter high intensity and the DTI. And then I'll be talking lastly about something called PET imaging. And PET is an imaging that allows us to look at sugar metabolism. Sugar is the main fuel for the brain, and we can measure how much sugar is being consumed in different parts of the brain to look at the function of the brain. And, and, uh, and these four imaging techniques show evidence of abnormalities that occur in utero uh, 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 and which created abnormalities consistent with severe neurodevelopmental disorders which have a significant impact in the ability to be able to 
form normal human relationships and the ability to uh, uh, and, and which result in an abnormal fixation or intensity so that so this is severe neurodevelopment disorder is associated with uh, kind of being stuck on something with it and, and fixated and, and so, it's, uh, so the first two ones I'll talk about will show evidence mm -hmm. that's consistent with this severe neurodevelopment disorder of the MRI quantitative volumetrics and the white matter high intensities. And he also shows something that is consistent with a significant neurodegenerative disorder, uh, which is a result of multiple traumatic brain injuries, which causes uh, 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 a very high probability of developing a condition called CTE, or chronic traumatic encephalopathies, like what is seen in many athletes who have sustained significant uh, concussions. And so, uh, and so, uh, so he had a combination of a severe lifelong neurodevelopmental disorder, abnormality times hemogene, severe neurodegenerative disorders resulting from uh, traumatic brain injuries that likely occurred when he was nine and twenty, and and so I'll be discussing those uh, as uh, in my uh, presentation today. Okay, what slide would you like to start? Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Sir. So the first mm -hmm. one that I'm going to talk about is MRI quantitative biometrics, and if you can go to the next slide, please. So MRI quantitative biometrics that, uh, is the ability to be able to measure different parts of the brain like the hippocampus or the amygdala, was very high accuracy. And this has only been possible in the last 15 years with the advent of uh, computing technology. When I was a medical student and, and, and rather than we used to measure all these things, was the limiter said it would take literally like a week to measure all different parts of the brain. But with advancing computer technology, we can develop algorithm that can categorize different parts of the brain and measure them with very high precision and accuracy. It's something that we used to do by hand manually, uh, and that would take weeks, we can now do minutes. And, and, uh, and so a lot of this was de uh, developed uh, with significant government support uh, and, and then privatized. Uh, and, and so there's a company called Cortex, which has an FDA approved license for the measurement of brain volumes. And so, let's see if we can go on to the next slide, please. And so this is an example of what we call brain segmentation and differentiation. So that we have how much that can say, this is a gray matter. So the pink stuff is gray matter. The white stuff is a white matter that connects different uh, pink stuff with gray matter. And then the green stuff represents things like the uh, amygdala, the hippocampus, and the, the brown is the cerebellum. And, and so, and so we have computer algorithms that can separate out what's gray matter, what's white matter, what's amygdala, uh, which is an important emotional center, uh, with very high precision and measuring them. And if we can go on to the next slide, please. And so this has been subjected to multiple peer review, and it turns out that they're much more accurate than the average radiologist at detecting atrophy. Uh, the human eye is not very good at detecting, for example, a 10 to 15 percent decrease in volume or change in volume even if it's very significant, when it's these type of technologies are very accurate, and, and if we can move on to the next slide, please. And so neural quant is uh, one of the software that we're, we'll be using. And the next you mentioned peer review. What do you mean by peer review? Peer review means that other doctors and scientists who are specialists in the area uh, believe, have reviewed the article that's been published, and have deemed this to be scientifically and medically accurate. And so this is a, uh, not junk science, this is something that has uh, been <coughs> reviewed by other scientists and doctors and published in, and, uh, and then cited by uh, other doctors. And so, and so this is a neural quant report, and, uh, and so the abnormalities that I'll be focusing on in particular are the first lines of total cerebral white matter and cerebellar white matter. And you'll see that these show that uh, Mr. Donaldson had an abnormal increase in the white matter of his brain. And if we move on to the next slide, please. Uh, so uh, I've blown these up here. And so you can see that he has an abnormal increase in both sides of the cerebellum and his white matter, and abnormal increase in the left side uh, uh, of his cerebral cortex. And if we can move on to the the next slide, please. Uh, so this uh, uh, shows uh, this just report that indicates that 
Next slide, please. Now, this is actually measures the white matter in the cerebellum of Mr. Smith and compared it with normal control averages. So he has uh, 20,000 cubic millimeters of white matter compared to 15,000 uh, in normal controls. And so this is a significant increase. It's almost 30% larger than normal. And on the right side, he has 23,000 cubic millimeters compared to 15,000 in normals. And this is almost 50% larger than normal. And so this is something that occurs in six out of a thousand people. And this type of white matter abnormality, we have an abnormal enlargement of white matter, is something that has been reported in severe neurodevelopmental disorders with lifelong patterns of problems with relating in terms of social interaction. And so people with this severe uh, malformation or miswiring of the, with too much white matter have significant problems with social interaction and they have a particular problem with being able to develop, maintain, understand normal human relationships lifelong. And they have problems with impairment in empathy. They have, uh, in, uh, in their brain has difficulty being able to experience the same in, in empathy. And they also have a behavior pattern of very restrictive, repetitive pattern of abnormal intensity and fixation. When they become fixated on something and they can't let it go, and that's all they think about, and they have it to an abnormal degree. And so, Doctor, is that like being stuck in third gear in a car? Yes, it's like being stuck in third gear and not being able to shift out. And, and this is something that they have a lifelong fixation with something. And, that uh, consumes them. And, 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 and if we can move on to the next slide, please. And so, uh, now, this type of severe lifelong neurodevelopmental disorder is also associated with a large hippocampus and amygdala. And so, having an abnormally large hippocampus and amygdala is also associated with a severe lifelong neurodevelopmental disorder. And, uh, uh, and uh, the hippocampus and the amygdala are very important emotional centers of the brain that help to process normal human emotions. And so when you have this abnormal enlargement, this is seen in this type of uh, severe neurodevelopment disorder with severe uh, problems with social interaction and, uh, and severe fixations. Uh, next slide, please. Hey, Dr. Can I back up a little bit? Sure. When you're talking about the severe <coughs> fixation on something, what, what happens when you mix in a person who is at an early age and throughout life has become a pedophile? And, well, this is a, <coughs> one, uh, it, it's, it's, this can become, uh, pedophilia can become the focus of this fixation, abnormal intensity, <coughs> where a person becomes abnormally fixated to the point that uh, they're not really interested in anything else or much else uh, in, in terms of. Uh, uh, this is the, the main fascination, passion, focus, consumption, and they can't shift gears. Okay. Now, it, you know, I mean, other people with this sort of might have a fixation on trains or, you know, on ghosts, for example. You know, so, so, so it's almost like a. Uh, uh, once a person with a severe neurodevelopmental disorder becomes fixated on something, whether it's train or uh, pedophilia or ghosts, it, it becomes something that's all they think about and, and they become consumed with that thing. Okay, and a person who has a neurodevelopmental disorder like that, um, that causes this fixation, that's, that's something that's sort of, for lack of a better way of saying it, that's wired into them. That's How correct. Brain developed. That's correct. So the, the, this type of lifelong neurodevelopmental disorder, when you have this abnormal intensity and focus and fixation on something, that's a, what is called very repetitive or restrictive. That this is the only thing, they, the predominant thing they, they think about. And it, and, and, and it can vary widely. You know, so some people become very fixated on uh, you know, butterflies or uh, trains, or, uh, and they uh, become experts in that, you know, or, or other things. And, and, but, uh, and sometimes that can be very useful, you know, because sometimes if you become fixated on something like computers, uh, you might become great computer uh, uh, scientists, you know. Uh, so, but sometimes it can be functional, sometimes it can be very maladaptive, you know, but the intensity of the fixation is uh, neurologically wired into the brain. Now, 
Another cause for enlarged amygdala, this is how normal enlarged amygdala we see on neuroquine, is severe emotional neglect. And so, uh, so that's the second, and, and Mr. Smith has uh, had a history of being, being severely emotionally neglected. And we know from, for example, studies with Romanian orphans. Uh, now, uh, in Romania, there was a dictator named Ceausescu, and he was fixated on having the population get larger. So he banned birth control, and so Romanian women had 10, 15 kids, and, 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 they, and a large number of these kids ended up in Romanian orphanages where they got very little uh, emotional care. They were, they were hardly touched on, they were just basically fed. And when the researchers went back and looked at these Romanian orphans who were severely emotionally neglected, they found they had abnormally enlarged amygdalas. Uh, just like Mr. Smith. Now, uh, this is also seen, as I said, as a very new development disorder. So, it has two possible causes for this abnormal enlargement in the amygdala. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, these Romanian orphans also grew up with a severe deficit in their ability to be able to empathize, their uh, ability to interact. And so, it has two possible reasons why uh, uh, these might be problems that he has uh, neurologically. Uh, if you go on to the next slide, please. Okay. And Doctor, these conditions, for lack of a better word, they're set in motion at a very early age. Yes, and, and so this severe neurodevelopmental disorder appears to be due to some kind of malformation in utero while the brain is being developed. And it's believed that there are a number of possible environmental factors that can cause this to occur. It could be toxins, you know, and there are some evidence uh, 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 just that certain environmental toxins might be a factor, like certain kinds of, uh, like uh, weed killers, uh, you know, uh, uh, Roundup, for example. You know, I mean, so being exposed to this kind of toxin can alter the brain development in utero. It can be due to possible maternal streptococcal infections. It can be due to other types of things, but some type of environmental insult in utero, whether it's toxic, whether it's infection, can cause the uh, what we call the neuronal genesis. But during the, in, uh, the, the brain's development in utero, the brain has neurons that are being created, uh, uh, and that's called genesis. And then they migrate or move along a certain path, and they differentiate. And so when you have these kind of environmental insults, whether it's due to some kind of environmental toxin or infection, this can cause a miswiring of the brain that can cause this kind of abnormal enlargement of white matter in the brain, and this cause this abnormal enlargement of the amygdala hippocampus, and this can cause uh, this kind of syndrome, this severe lifelong neurodevelopmental disorder with severe uh, deficits in the ability to engage in normal social interactions and the ability, and then with severe uh, problems with becoming abnormally fixated and this restrictive repetitive pattern of fascinations. Okay, and Dr. you've used the term in utero several times. What does that mean? In utero means while the baby is in, being carried in the uterus of the mother. So during, for example, the second, third trimester, if a, a mother is exposed to some kind of toxin or has some kind of infection, that uh, uh, appears to significantly increase the risk of developing a severe neurodevelopmental disorder that causes the uh, neurons uh, to uh, grow incorrectly and to migrate incorrectly to uh, its correct path. Now, he also shows Abnormal and MRI quantity body metrics that are right sided. So, on a normal quantity, shows there's right sided cerebral gray matter decrease. Now, uh, using a different kind of uh, MRI measuring software, we're also seeing an abnormal decrease in the right foreground from parenchyma compared to the left side. That's three standard deviations above the norm. So, that uh, normally the normal brain is slightly larger on the right side, 33.6 versus 33.18. His is actually smaller on the right side, 32.3 versus 32.87. And this is a statistically significant abnormality. Uh, this is a, about a one in a thousand chance of occurring by a chance alone. <laughs> and so, this is the kind of thing that we see in individuals who have sustained some kind of brain injury to the right forebrain parenchyma, which is called some kind of atrophy. And so, and so the quantitative biometrics also shows, in addition to this abnormal increase in white matter, 
is to have more enlargement in the amygdala. It is this lifetime deficit. Now, this has significant implications. So if we move on to the next uh, uh, slide, right? we know that lifetime corporal injuries can result in abnormal sexual preferences. That a brain injury on the lifetime can result in a hypersexuality or sexual disinhibition and can alter sexual orientation towards children or can release a pedophilic orientation in predisposed individuals. That individuals who sustain lifetime damage to the brain uh, are, are it, it can either alter their normal sexual preferences uh, and change their normal sexual object uh, preference so that if uh, if known, someone would normally prefer adults, it can actually uh, uh, cause a neurological shift towards children. And there are documented reports of right side of brain injury that kind of, where you see an individual's sexual orientation uh, of what they're attracted to shift as a result of this. And so this is a, a right side of injury is known to do this, and he has a right side of injury uh, in, in the cortex uh, uh, that's measurable on neural points. And let's see if we can move on to the next slide, please. Okay, Doctor, when you say it is known to do that, are you referring to out in the medical world, those, that idea has been peer reviewed by professionals and it's just something that doctors think now? Yes, I mean, this is, a, this is something that is a peer reviewed medical science literature. Right sided injuries to the brain can cause operations of sexual preference uh, or sexual object preference and can actually, uh, it appears to be associated with an increase. Uh, in uh, uh, pedophilic orientation. So those are some of the findings that we see on the MRI quantitative biometrics. Uh, so, so to sum up, we saw an abnormal increase in white matter, which is seen in this kind of severe lifelong neurodevelopmental disorder with an impairment in with social interaction and restricted uh, fixation. We see this uh, right side of injury, which is associated with uh, abnormal sexual fixation. And we see, uh, um, and so those are the, the main things that we see with the quantity of biometrics. So let's shift gears to the MRI white matter hypointensities. Now, white matter hypointensities are another way of looking at abnormalities that are a result of a malformation of cortical development due to early neuronal genesis maturation and migration. And so neuronal genesis means the genesis of or creation of new neurons as a neuron sprout in the brain uh, during pregnancy. Maturation means that these neurons are kind of immature and they, they have to uh, mature and they have to move, they have to migrate the brain. And so if we move on to the next slide please. So this is not Mr. Smith's brain. This is a illustration of what white matter hypotensities look like uh, for people who are not familiar with what white matter hypotensities look like. And so these yellow circles show areas of white matter hypotensities. And this is something that can be measured with, again, high precision now uh, uh, with uh, computerized algorithms. And if we move on to the next slide, please. Now, we know that these kind of white matter hypotensities can occur from things such as maternal infection, like streptococcal maternal infection, or corneal amnionitis, or prenatal brain injury. They can cause abnormal increase in white matter hypointensities. If we move on to the next slide, please. Now, if we look at Mr. Smith's white matter hypointensities, and we look at normals, normals have about 1,757 cubic millimeters of white matter hypointensities with a standard deviation of about 694. Now, Mr. Smith has over 5,000 cubic millimeters of white matter hypotensity. Now, this has a p value of 1.7 times 10 to the minus 6. That means only 1.7 out of a million persons would have this number of hypotensities. And so, this is almost triple the number of white matter hypotensity that are normal. And so, uh, this is seen in individuals with this significant lifelong neural development disorders with impaired social interactions and empathy and abnormal fixation obsessions. Now, we know that uh, the higher the amount of white matter hypotensities is associated with a higher degree of this restrictive repetitive behavior uh, that, that 
higher the white matter hyper intensity is, uh, research has shown is associated with a greater degree of fixation. So that you become more and more fixated, more and more restricted, more and more repetitive in terms of your fixation. And that's your analogy about being stuck in third gear. Yes, uh huh. And this is an extraordinarily high uh, uh, degree of white matter hyper intensity that is a, 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 uh, a in usual malfunction associated with likely toxic environmental or infectious uh, uh, insults to the brain. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay, before we move on, Dr. Um, this num these numbers right here, the odds of it occurring are uh, 1 in 1.7 million yes. people. Um, so, so, Mr. Smith's brain, if we extrapolate that out, um, the entire population of the United States is about 300 something million. Right. This would occur in about 600 people. That's correct. Okay. So this isn't something you see very often. This is a very rare degree of white matter hypotensity. It's is highly abnormal. Uh, but it's the kind of thing that we see in this severe neurodevelopment disorder with abnormal social interactions and abnormal fixations. Okay. Okay. So, so we've talked about uh, white matter content by metrics of large abnormal amount of white matter and uh, the right sided uh, atrophy of the cortex. We've talked about the white matter high intensity. And, uh, and so the third type of MRI imaging I'm discussing is MRI diffusion tension imaging, or DTI. And we can move on to the next slide, please. So this is an example of diffusion tension imaging in Mr. Donald Smith's brain, what we call the corpus plus tractography. Now, uh, if you see that there are some areas that are kind of black, and let's see, is, is there a, a Dr. way we can... I believe you can touch the screen with okay. the and circle the yeah, see. So is this area here, and this area here, and these areas here, uh, these are areas of abnormal decreases in the, uh, what we call the cables that connect the right side of the brain to the left side of the brain. Uh, you can see that other parts of the brain are, are intact, uh, uh, but, uh, but uh, these areas in particular show that uh, there is a shortening of the fiber track length of the corpus callosum. Now, I'll be talking about how these fiber tracks are measured. I'll talk about some of the physics principles that underlie this more advanced MRI imaging technology. Now, I'll be talking about another property that we can derive from MRI DTI called fractional anisotropy. So, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so this is my report that talks about abnormal decreases in fractional anisotropy and this decrease in fiber track length. In mid after and mid post report close them. And, and let me go on to the next slide, please. Okay, so these red areas are areas that have more increases in the internal capsule, this area here, 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 here. These are these red spots are areas that are abnormally high FA. That's seen in individuals with old traumatic brain injuries. And then uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. Okay, let's see. And uh, let's, can we move to the previous step? Okay. So this area, in, I'll focus on this area in particular here. That red spot, uh, if we can move, is the mid corpus close up. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Okay. So I'll be talking about that spot, but first I'll be doing a basic uh, background as to how we can measure these axons in the brain. And so the way the diffusion tensor imaging works is that it looks at the diffusion of water molecules in the axons. Axons are these like cables that connect different parts of the brain to each other, like the right side, the left side, the front to the back, the top and the bottom. They're like the equivalent of internet cables or phone cables, except that they're like, like long straws. And, and so you can look at the diffusion of water molecules in these long straws that connect different parts of the brain to each other. And if we move on to the next slide, please. So here is this axon. And this is like a long straw. And the water molecule moves inside the straw here. And if we move on to the next slide, please. Now, when you have some kind of head trauma, you have like what we call a shearing of the straw, where the axons are sheared. And then the water molecule is no longer able to diffuse. It, 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 it starts to leak out. In, into these 
these areas around here. And so this is what uh, diffusion text imaging looks at is the integrity of those atoms are strong and the diffusion of the water molecules. And if we move on to the next slide, please. And so what happens is that after you have some kind of uh, traumatic brain injury, you have shearing, and then you can have shortening, which is what we saw of uh, those uh, tractography a uh, few slides back. So you can go back and show uh, the color image of before. But, uh, so, so this right here. <coughs> yes. Yeah, and then you can see how the, the, the atoms are shorter now, and then we go back to the very beginning here. Yeah, right here. So, so that's what we're seeing here. So these black areas here, these are the result of shearing or the axons. So, yeah, uh, so these areas here are missing uh, uh, the normal diffusion of the water molecule in those areas. So if we can go back to the previous slide we were at. Okay, so if we move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so that, that's what we, we're seeing here. And if we move on to the next slide, please. So now, uh, uh, so uh, uh, a good metaphor to talk about how DTI works is that if you use, put a straw in a glass of water, and you put it on top of a food dye or soy sauce in a straw, that food dye straw will stay inside the straw. Uh, and, but let's say that straw had a lot of holes in it, it was torn. Well, that food that will start to diffuse out of the hole of that straw. And that's what is happening when we look at diffusion capture imaging. So if we look at the next slide, please. So this is, uh, so here there's no straw. And so normally, when you put a drop of food dye in a glass of water, it diffuses in all directions equally. So if we move on to the next slide, please. So this is what we call isotropic diffusion. Like uh, you've heard it from isosceles triangle, which is three right-sided equal uh, lengths. Well, iso means equal, and so uh, trophy is like atrophy, you know, like a, uh, so uh, it means shape. And so isotope means that in the, uh, water has a tendency to diffuse isotropically in all uh, directions. But if we move to the next slide, please. If you were to put that drop of food out in a straw, then the diffusion will no longer be isotropic, it will be and isotropic from uh, and, meaning not, not equal diffusion. And it will be highly and isotropic in its diffusion. If you can move on to the next slide, please. And so here is a straw which has 100% fractional anisotropy. And here is no straw with 0% fractional anisotropy. And so you can actually look at this as a series of fractions that go from 0 to 1. And so areas of the brain that have, say, intact uh, accents would have a higher fraction, like say, 0.7, where areas of the brain that have damage would have a lower fraction, like 0.5, if you be closer to zero and further away from the one. And so if we move on to the next slide. So for example, a typical healthy anterior corpus callosum would have a value of 0.75, and a typical FA, or fractional anisotropy, or a TBI, or traumatic brain injury, is 0.6. And this would be about three standard deviations below the mean, or about one chance in a thousand. And so, so we can. And so this is another thing that we can look at with DTI is this uh, fractional anisotropy. Now, if we go to the next slide, please. And this is something that's well accepted. You know, books on this, hundreds of articles on this. Uh, let's see. If we move, uh, can we get rid? Of, okay, move on to the next slide. Get rid of the red circles there. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, I show you that red spot here. So here I've blown this red spot up for uh, the jurors to be able to have a closer look at what's going on here. And I measured the FA in that red spot, and I measured that FA in normal control. Normal control FA value in that particular area is 0.63, with a standard deviation of 0.04. So that means, that 0.04 means that two standard deviation above and below the mean would have 95% of the population so 0 0.63 minus, point, uh, minus 0 0.8, which would be about uh, uh, 0.5, uh, uh, let's see, uh, let's see, it would be about 0.5, uh, uh, 7, something like that, and then, uh, and then uh, 0 0.8 above, 0 0.71, that would be like 95%. And then three standard deviations have like 99% of the population, so 0.12 is like point from, from 0 0.5, uh, 1. <laughs> to like 0.75 would have 99% of the population. He is almost a standard deviation out of the mean. Now the chances of this occurring 
uh, randomly are 3.8 times 10 to the minus 14th, and 3.8 out of 100 trillion. Now, to help the jurors visualize, what does this mean? Uh, what does a tr 100 trillion mean? So, for example, a million seconds would be 11 and a half days. That's uh, uh, 10 to the 6. A billion seconds, 10 to the 9, it would be 32 years. A trillion seconds would be 32,000 years. And so his, uh, this uh, Abernathy in the FA is something that would 3.8 out of 100 trillion. Now, to look at the Earth's population, the Earth's population has about 12 billion people, uh, roughly, I think, yes. Yeah, so uh, the chance of this occurring in any normal human being on Earth is essentially zero, you know. Uh, and, and so this is a highly abnormal decrease in FA, but it's a kind of abnormal decrease in FA that I see all the time in people who have sustained significant brain injuries, and especially older brain injuries. Uh, and, so, and so this is not at all uncommon in individuals with serious, uh, with a history of significant brain injuries. And so, the, uh, let's see, uh, so, in this so, case, so, so Dr. the chance of this occurring naturally or just by, by chance are, are astronomical, but you do see it in people that have brain In normal, it would be 3.8 out of 100 trillion, which essentially means uh, about as close to zero as you can get mathematically. Uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, but in brain injury, this is very common. I see it all the time in people with significant issues of multiple traumatic brain injuries. And so this is a, uh, uh, and so, uh, and so this would be very consistent with Mr. Smith having had some history of serious brain injury in the past. Uh, and when I reviewed the records that uh, were provided to me uh, by uh, uh, Brooke Butler, he has had uh, at least a couple of significant injuries, head injuries. He had a significant head injury when he was 20, when he hit an oak tree and he flipped his car, and he had a significant head injury when he was 9, when he was riding a bike. And so this is the kind of thing that we would see, I would see, in an individual who had that kind of history. Uh, <coughs> let's see, can we move on? Dr. <coughs> Brooke Butler has been introduced to the jury before, and she will be testifying later today. You're indicating that you learned things from her by talking to her, by reading her reports? Yes, I talked to her and read her reports, yes. Okay. So she did, she's, she's our mitigation coordinator, and your understanding of that is she interviews a lot of people, including Mr. Smith. Yes. And, and provides you a sort of a factual background about his life from the time that he's a child up until now. Right, that she's a fact gatherer. Yes. Fact gatherer. Okay. Yes. So I rely on fact gatherers for information about the patient from the history. Okay. Okay. So we can move on to the next slide then. So this decrease in FA is consistent with very significant traumatic brain injury. Also the kind of uh, injury that I see in people at Congress for CTE, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, like what we see in a lot of sports injuries these days. Uh, individuals with multiple uh, 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 concussion, multiple brain injuries. And it's very consistent with the kind of abnormalities that are on neuropsych deficits, that Dr. Sesto was going into much greater lengths since he, that's his specialty, but he has a number of neuropsychological deficits that are very consistent with this kind of abnormality, including problems with dichotic listening, which is the kind of thing you would see with a focus flow some abnormality, because dichotic listening involves the ability to connect the right side of the brain to the left side of the brain. And CTE is a neurodegenerative disorder, and I'm going into a little more on what CTE is and what this means behaviorally. Okay, but before you do that, um, neurodegenerative disorder is the broader class of conditions. And yes. CTE is one of those conditions that's in that broad class. Yes, it is, it is a subtype of neurodegenerative Other things like Alzheimer's disease, for example, is another neurodegenerative disorder. Uh, so this is a type of a neurodegenerative disorder. The brain's deteriorating uh, uh, due to some pathology. Uh, and this, uh, uh, let's see, so if we move on to the next uh, slide, please. And so, and so, uh, so he had, I asked him when he was 20, 1976, he hits this oak tree, orange picker road, took his car, he had this bicycle accident. And he also had other problems in non verbal memory, executive function, spatial perceptual function, noted by Dr. Sesson, that would be very consistent with the history of multiple TBIs. Uh, and by TBIs, yeah, from back brain injuries. And so, I won't go into those, Dr. Sesson will go into those in real life. Oh, let's see, the next slide, please. Now, we know that there are a number of very important behavioral implications of brain injuries. 
So if you sustain a brain injury, then you're going to have a much greater risk of becoming a substance abuser. We know that brain injuries can affect the uh, judgment center of the brain, can affect the impulse regulation of the brain. So we know that people with brain injuries are much more likely to become highly addicted to multiple substances because the brain areas that are involved with judgment and impulse regulation are damaged. And we also know that people with a brain injury are much more likely to have severe mood problems. And, and Mr. Smith has had a history of severe depression and suicidal thoughts that reported in 2011. We know that brain injury can result in behavior that looks like antisocial behavior. And where, where it looks like you don't care about people, where you uh, 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 are, are, are callous. But, but the, the, the important thing from a diagnostic perspective is that antisocial personality disorder has to be made in the absence of neurological insults that can explain that. Uh, so this is in a person with an intact brain. Now, you can have antisocial behavior that is a result of brain damage where your ability to regulate impulses or judgment makes you look like an antisocial person who has more brain uh, that way. But it's not antisocial behavior, personality, uh, from a strictly medical perspective, but it can look like that. Now, it can Dr. Smith, it's possible a psychologist could have interviewed Mr. Smith years ago and concluded, with, without the type of testing you do, that he has antisocial behavior. Yes, I mean, if you are unaware of history of brain injury that might have been a factor in this, yes, I can see how it would be very easy to make misdiagnosis. This happens all the time because uh, you know, doctors don't always have a complete historical and medical record available on the people that they're interviewing. And, and without that, it's very easy to make misdiagnosis. And we also know that brain injury can increase the risk of developing psychotic disorders. And Mr. Smith has a history of auditory and visual hallucinations uh, uh, that uh, occur intermittently, and this is consistent with uh, a brain injury. And we know that uh, uh, brains can increase other impulse disorders, uh, so that we uh, become, become sexually disinhibited with brain injuries. And so there are many uh, neural behavioral complications that result from brain injuries, uh, and this uh, DTI shows astronomical decrease in that is highly consistent with the history of multiple old traumatic brain injuries. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay, and that's the picture you showed us earlier. Yes. With the black spaces, and then you drew the lines down. Into the yes, yes. Uh -huh. And the, that red spot in the previous slide. Uh, <coughs> next slide, please. And we know that, that uh, having a history of multiple traumatic brain injuries can also set one up for a condition known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This is linked to multiple old traumatic brain injuries, and this is a result in this unleashing a cascade of events in which the brain starts to deteriorate, sometimes decades after the injury, and which can result in a progressive decline over time of memory, impulse control, cognition. And uh, if you move on to the next slide, please. And so if you look at uh, a CTE type of brain at the bottom, which is a normal brain at the top, you see that these, this reddish area here includes the, uh, abnormalities that are consistent with uh, uh, CTE and that there's shrinkage in, in, in the brain. And Mr. Uh, Smith has shrinkage on the right side of his cortex of the brain. Uh, let's see, in the north on the north part. Next slide, please. And we know that CTE is much more likely to develop if you've had a traumatic brain injury earlier. So for example, we know that professional athletes who started playing before age 12 are much more likely to develop CTE than professional athletes who started playing after 12. And, 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 uh, uh, and, and, and we know the younger brain is much more susceptible to diffuse brain injury, which leads to pronounced behavioral and cognitive deficits. And Mr. Smith was blind when he had at least one of his TBIs with a bicycle accident, which should have put him in prime territory for risk of developing CTE, uh, especially when he combined this with a second injury at 20 when he had the car that flipped. And next slide. Yeah, we, we use this term TBI or traumatic brain injury. Does it have to be uh, a super serious injury? I mean, we see two kids collide on the football field and, and one gets up and he's got a name. 
that's, the, that's kind of what we're talking about, right? Well, it doesn't, it, 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 this can be so much, concussions don't even necessarily have to have a complete loss of consciousness. You can have what we call automation consciousness, and we know this because there are multiple professional athletes who had uh, 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 these concussions without loss of consciousness, who later developed a CTE. And, and so it, it's clear that a loss of consciousness is not essential to develop CTE. Having multiple brain injuries is the uh, prerequisite. And, and, uh, uh, and so, uh, yeah, a loss of consciousness is not required. So traumatic brain injury, it's a, it's a big term, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a big trauma, right? That's correct. That's, that's, okay. that's correct. We know that uh, uh, multiple concussions can, can uh, set one up for, for this. Uh, and, uh, uh, okay. and let's see, next slide please. So, so, uh, so, uh, so we talked about three different types of MRI. We talked about MRI quantitative biometrics that have a whole amount of white matter seen in severe neural development disorders with significant social impairment and abnormal fixations. We've seen this uh, MRI white matter hypotensity, uh, which is seen in people who have had maternal insults, like an infection from a toxic exposure. We've seen uh, this uh, DCI, these cables, uh, with this abnormal decrease with chances that are like one in 100 trillion of this being normal and a very consistent with one credit brain injury. The now we're going to shift gears uh, and talk about PET scans. And so PET scans are a different kind of uh, imaging modality than PET scan than uh, MRI imaging, but it, it's been around for decades. There have been thousands of articles that have talked about PET scans. And PET scans show from positron emission tomography. And, uh, and let me show you an example of a PET scan. So, uh, so this is a typical normal PET scan. And you'll see that in the normal typical normal PET scan, you see these colors here, and the colors indicate the amount of sugar consumption. Red indicates areas of higher sugar consumption, and blue indicates lower sugar consumption. Green is sort of a yellow in between. And we know that PET scans are much more sensitive at detecting brain injuries than say many MRI scans. So for example, you can actually have a normal, a typical MRI uh, of a cadaver, and, but if you were to get a PET scan of a cadaver, you get a blank screen because there's no sugar being consumed. Or you can have someone who's in a coma who can have a normal, a conventional MRI sequence uh, because the structure of the brain on here is normal, but if you were to do a PET scan of someone in a coma, the PET scan would be like all blue or, or, or green, bluish green, because there's very little sugar being consumed. So we you know PET scans are much more sensitive than conventional MRI scans. Let's see, if we move on to the next slide, please. So how are PET scans, uh, what's the basic underlying physics of PET scans? So PET scans rely on something called positron, which is short for positive electron. A positive electron is a form of antimatter. The electrons in our universe are normally negatively charged. Now, antimatter doesn't normally exist in our universe, but we can create antimatter using a device called a cyclotron. Now, the advantage of creating an antimatter version of the electron is that when you combine antimatter with matter, you get the transformation of the mass in the matter and the antimatter into pure energy using Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared. E equals energy and m equals the mass. So the mass of the positron and electron are converted into energy. And if any of you are science fiction fans, you may remember the show Star Trek in which the U.S.'s enterprise is powered by a matter and a matter engine. While that show is science fiction, the basic physics principle that the combination of matter and a matter creates tremendous energy is in fact a well-accepted physics principle, and it's a fundamental physics principle that underlies PET scans. Uh, and if you move on to the next slide, please. So this is how we create an antimatter version of an uh, electron emitter. And so you'll see these triangular uh, uh, magnets here. This is if you lift up the foot of a cyclotron, which is a 22-ton instrument, and it costs several million dollars. And if you move on to the next slide, please. This is a schematic of a cyclotron, and you'll see these two triangular magnets. And these triangular magnets will alternately either uh, track or repel charged subatomic particles and get them to move in circles. And so that each, and with each alternation of uh, attraction and repulsion, these charged subatomic particles move faster and faster and faster. 
It's kind of like slapping a merry go round. So you get the merry go round going faster and faster and faster. So that by the time the charged subatomic particle comes up from the cyclotron and strikes a target, it is traveling at almost the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles a second. So the charged subatomic particle is traveling about 99.99% of the speed of light. And it takes that kind of speed for the charged subatomic particle to bombard the target to create an antimatter emitter, the fluorine 18. Now, can we move on to the next slide, please? So the 4018, which is created by this bombardment of the charged subatomic particle, uh, is attached to a sugar-like compound called deoxyglucose. Sugar is a main fuel for the brain, and it's attached in a hot cell. So if we go on to the next slide, please. So the next slide shows a radio chemist in front of a hot cell, and there's a two-inch thick leaded glass window which shields the radio chemist from the deadly radiation of the fluorine 18. And he's using robotic manipulators to attach the fluorine 18 to a sugar molecule, which would then be injected into the patient. So we can go on to the next slide, please. And so in order to inject into the patient, we need an intravenous line. So if you move on to the next slide, please. So this chemical is, is injected into the patient and it starts flowing through their blood system. Yes, exactly. And, uh, and so here is a model. The model has an intravenous line being placed in his arm. Uh, and then, uh, next slide, please. And then here, we're seeing that after the radioactive sugar molecule, the point A is taking into the, the, the brain, uh, it takes about 30 minutes for the sugar molecule to be absorbed by the brain. And then after that, you place the patient's head inside the, uh, the PET scanner. It's like a giant donut here. And, and the PET scanner is like the developing tank. And if we move on to the next slide, please. And here you see this E plus molecule, which is being emitted from the fluorine 18 sugar molecule. And it's combined with the E minus molecule here, the uh, regular electron. So you have the antimatter, the E plus, the matter, the E minus, and then they annihilate each other. So we call it annihilation decay. And then you have the energy rate that emerge at 180 degree angles from the annihilation decay. And so you have energy rays that come off uh, and strike these uh, crystal detectors. And you have coincidence circuits built into the crystal detectors that when two... I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I am having a really hard time understanding. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll try to slow down. I know I'm going too fast, Bobby. I'll try to slow down. Uh, I apologize. You have um, energy rays that uh, strike the crystal detectors, and you have a coincidence circuit so that when two detectors coincidentally uh, register a hit, the coincidence circuit says, aha, there is an energy ray pair that came off that caused a simultaneous registration of the energy rays. And so the computer draws a line between those two crystals. And if we move on to the next, uh, so basically. Mr. Fletcher, yes. I think if we took a breath between each slide, just to, to give it just a, a moment, I mean, uh, it would help all of us a little bit. Okay, just slow it down a little bit, I guess. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I know I've been told before I speak too fast and I get excited. It's hard for me to slow down. I'm trying to miss you on that. I sincerely apologize. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, okay, so this is a schematic of the crystal detectors in the PET scanner. And so you can see that when, when energy rate pair goes off and simultaneously strikes two crystals, a line is drawn between those two pairs of crystal detectors. And so basically, we're looking at a million of these intersecting lines where areas that have the fluorine 18 antimatter are the source of millions more energy rays that emerge from that part of the brain. And areas that have less sugar have fewer energy rays emanating from that part of the brain. So there are fewer intersecting lines where there's less sugar and more intersecting lines where there's more sugar. And so that's the basic physics behind how the PET scan works. Uh, next slide, so, so the last 10 or so slides, you basically introduced the jury to the science behind how PET scan works. Yes. And that gives us some of the most advanced imaging of a human brain being brain that we've ever seen. Yes, it's, it, it's a light year ahead of an X-ray, uh, EEG. Uh, let's see, uh, 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 let's move on to the next slide, please. So if we can remove the uh, uh, red marks there. So, so the, so PET scans are approved by Medicare, uh, for example, to assess Alzheimer's disease. It's much more sensitive and accurate in detecting Alzheimer's disease than your typical MRI scan. And so you'll see that there's less sugar being consumed here in this part of the brain compared to an age-matched control. It's, it's uh, less red. 
And uh, uh, let's see, if we move on to the next slide, please. If we can move those red marks again. And so here, this is a three-dimensionally rendered view of an Alzheimer's disease patient brain compared to an age <coughs> control. And you see that there is, is a blue area here, and there's less uh, sugar being consumed in that part of the brain. Uh, let's see. Next slide, please. And so we know that uh, PET scans are considered reliable for things like Alzheimer's disease, and they can help confirm diagnoses. Uh, next slide, please. Now, Mr. Smith had an abnormal PET scan report, and he had an abnormally low neocortical cerebral ratio of metabolism, and an abnormally high level of metabolism in the glycosum. And I'll go through what all this means. Uh, let's see, so if we can move on to the next slide, please. And we can clear the, the uh, red uh, marks away, please. So, so the, this area here, this is the cerebellum here. Now, the cerebellum is this part of the brain in the back. The small part of the brain in the back of the brain is involved with things like coordination and balance. And, uh, and normally, it's colder than the rest of the brain, the neocortex on top, the frontal, parietal, and occipital lobe area. So normally, the neocortex is hotter than the cerebellum in the back. And you can actually make a ratio that looks at the metabolism in the neocortex compared to the neuron, to the metabolism in the cerebellum, in the denominator. And so in the normal brain, the neocortex, which would be the rest of this area here, would normally be significantly hotter than the cerebellum. So just eyeballing this, I can say this is an abnormal scan. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, now, uh, uh, now this is obvious to someone uh, who has looked at a lot of patients with like CTE, or likely CTE of traumatic brain injury. If you're the kind of physician who doesn't see a lot of traumatic brain injuries, you probably wouldn't recognize this pattern. You probably wouldn't have seen it. The average physician who does PET scanning doesn't see a lot of brain injuries. And the average physician who does PET scanning does mostly tumors. And so if they saw this, they might say, oh, this doesn't show any tumor. So this must be a normal scan. They are unfamiliar with this kind of pattern. Uh, but uh, I, my subspecialty is brain injury, and I've seen this pattern a lot. And it's not just my visual read, which is abnormal, but it is quantitatively and numerically and statistically abnormal. And I'll show you the statistics of how I derive this quantitatively. And uh, let's see if we can go on to the next slide, please. Let's go to the red marks again. So, uh, as is well documented, visual analysis may be insufficient to uncover subtle metabolic disruption. More objective methods would be helpful for your textbooks, like SPM. And so that's what I've utilized is statistical parametric mapping, an objective method for assessing abnormalities. Uh, so, if I can move on to the next slide, please. And so this is uh, invaluable. Now, SPM is not normally used clinically, but it's very helpful in uh, forensic cases, especially in life or death matter cases, where it's uh, important to rely on numbers, not just eyeballs and image. OK, uh, uh, the next slide, please. And so if I do a statistical parametric map analysis of Mr. Smith, you'll see that he shows these abnormalities, these black spots here in the cerebellum which are highly abnormal. And if I move from one to the next slide, please. OK, so these abnormal statistical increases uh, are five standard deviations abnormal. So this means two out of uh, uh, 10 million would have this kind of abnormality on a PET scan. And so this is not just my visual read. This is statistical and objective numerical data which shows this is a highly abnormal brain pattern. Uh, if I can move on to the next slide, please. OK, and so, and so we look at this ratio here of the neocortex here, and look at this compared to the cerebellum here. Normal have a neocortex that is hotter than the cerebellum. So Mr. Smith's neocortex is actually colder than the cerebellum. And the reason why it's colder than the cerebellum is when you have 
a history of multiple traumatic brain injuries a long time ago. This causes diffuse damage throughout the brain. So the, 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 the amount of sugar being consumed in the neocortex is, uh, is much colder than normal. And this is a, a, a significant abnormality. Neocortical cerebral uh, abnormality is 3.3 gamma deviation below the norm, or uh, roughly uh, 9 out of 10,000. <coughs> I see. And then if you move on to the next slide, please. Now, this is the kind of pattern I see all the time in like in, in athletes who are at high risk for CTE. Uh, this decreased new cortisol ratio is something that's been published in peer reviewed literature. Uh, I am one of co authors of, of this publication. Uh, and uh, uh, the next slide, please. Now, he also shows an abnormal increase in this area of the brain here, the tostrum. Uh, this is an area of the brain that is part of the temporal lobe area. This is the kind of abnormality that we see in certain forms of like seizure disorders. So it's something called epilepsy spectrum disorder. And so this, uh, and, and we know that uh, brain injuries can cause this abnormal increase in activity in part of the brain. Now this is the part of the brain that's also involved with sexual uh, uh, preference, with sexual, uh, and so this is a, an abnormal excitation, uh, likely to do some kind of uh, epileptic uh, spectrum disorder, it's likely to do traumatic brain injury in an area of the brain that involves regulation of sexual behavior. Uh, Next slide, please. <coughs> okay, so if you can move that back, Mark again, please. And Doctor, just, just to remind you, um, you're, you're going to talk a little bit about tissue announcement, and this is stuff that you got from Brooke Bob. Yes, and the reason why I want to talk about that, in addition to the brain imaging, is that the neuroscience literature is very clear that there is a synergistic interaction between having brain damage and having an adverse environment, which includes abuse, that if you have a uh, adverse environment which includes abuse, like being molested or being neglected, but your brain is intact, you're much more likely to grow up normal. But if you have a damaged brain and you have a uh, abuse or neglect, you're much more likely to act out violently. And so there's a, a, a synergy there. Uh, you know, and, so, and, 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 so, and so the reason why uh, this is important is because there is a synergistic interaction between the new developmental abnormalities that Mr. Smith is born with from likely maternal uh, insults such as toxic exposure or infection, which causes neurodevelopmental disorder with severe social interaction impairments and severe fixed abnormal fixations. Uh, but uh, uh, and he had this neurodegenerative disorder, which he acquired, you know, from multiple traumatic brain injury, which is uh, uh, abnormal decrease in the connection to white matter and abnormal reduction in sugar metabolism. But he's also, in addition to those two major sources of brain abnormality, had multiple adverse life events, including being molested when he was eight years old by two older boys being emotionally neglected, being raped in 1997 by two male inmates. And so uh, the combination of having uh, multiple uh, abnormalities from uh, neurodevelopmentally acquired uh, malformation of the brain wiring and then brain injury and being molested and neglected and abused results in catastrophic uh, failure of impulse control. Uh, let's see, so if uh, we move on to the next slide, please. And so we know that uh, brain injury can uh, affect impulse control and that, uh, and that the parts of the brain that act like a brace, everyone has impulses, but generally uh, we curb our inappropriate impulses. We have an intact brain that says, don't do that. You know, but when your brain is damaged, either from a neurodevelopmental defect, from a maternal insult, like an infection or toxic exposure, or brain injury, we know that that ability of the brain to curb impulses is damaged, and so you're much likely to act out. Let's see. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we also know that brain injury can increase the likelihood of having other impulse control problems, like drug abuse. We know that uh, drug abuse can be a form of self-medication uh, that people try to use drugs to help treat their depression if they're depressed. 
They try to use stimulants to make them feel better, or if they feel anxious, they try to use these things. But we know that these stimulants or other things can cause a catastrophic failure of impulse control, so that your attempt to self-medicate your depression can, it's like it's like trying to put out a fire by putting gasoline on it. You know, I mean, it 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 it, it, it is uh, the exact opposite thing you should be doing. But uh, when uh, people are brain injured, their judgment is impaired. Their impulse regulation is impaired, they're depressed, they're trying to self-medicate. The thing that they try to use to self-medicate to paradoxically severely exacerbate the impulse problem that they have as a result of the brain injury. And that uh, and, and so uh, let's see. So if we move on to the next slide, please. And so just to summarize, uh, Mr. Smith has significant MRI quantitative biometrics and MRI white matter hypo intensity findings consistent with a severe neurodevelopment disorder and neurodegenerative disorders. His MRI quantitative biometric shows abnormal amounts of white matter, 30 to 50 percent higher than normal in the cerebellum, and is consistent with a severe neurodevelopment disorder characterized by profound lifelong impairment in the ability to develop normal relationships and with a profound abnormal intense fixations. And he also shows a wide side of cortical atrophy on the quantitative biometrics which would affect his sexual preference uh, uh, choice. Oh, let's see, can we go back? I haven't finished that. And, that's it. and then the white matter high intensity also showed an abnormal increase, almost triple the number, again consistent with severe neurodevelopment lifelong disorders, which have uh, caused, I think, such as maternal septal possible infection or toxic exposures like weed killers or other things. Let's see, and then the next slide. <coughs> Then he also has significant MRI DTI FA abnormalities where his FA shows an almost 50% decrease in the mid corpuscle with a chance of uh, that occurring 4 out of 100 trillion. You know, uh, and, and I, I mean, so, uh, you know, it's, I mean, that's a, uh, it's, you know, it, it is literally an astronomical odds, you know, uh, of this occurring in normal population. It's actually impossible to find in normal population, uh, but very common in people with multiple severe brain injuries, and, and, and very common in people with high risk for CTE. And we know that CTE causes a decade long deterioration in impulse control that gets worse and worse over time. Uh, and that, uh, that, and that uh, he also shows a PET scan finding, which showed an abnormal decrease in neocortical cerebellar ratio, similar to those of people at high risk for CTE. And uh, if you move on to the next slide, please. And so he has a set of a perfect storm with uh, severe uh, miswiring of his white matter. Uh, from uh, likely in utero insults from you know, toxic exposure and infection and, and multiple head traumas uh, and, uh, uh, and in addition to all of those he also had a history of being sexually traumatized, abused and physically and emotionally abused and neglected and we know that uh, neurologically speaking that all these combine to create an individual who's going to have catastrophic failure and impulse control. So that's uh, uh, my last slide. Okay, I do have a, a couple, one, one or two specific follow-ups, <coughs> Doc. And if you can help me find uh, my up here, it's not numbered, but I'm looking for the slide. I think it's in the 36. Uh, so, okay, keep going. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, keep, keep going. 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 Uh, actually, I think we passed it. Uh, let's see. Uh, no, actually, we have. Uh, keep going, keep going. Sorry. Forward? Uh, back, uh, then, then down towards the bottom. Okay. Doctor, um, if, if a person has a heart attack and they, their brain is deprived of, of oxygen for an extremely long time, would you see that on an MRI? You could see that on an MRI, but you wouldn't see it localized. Uh, you say, see, see you say localized, human, what do you mean? The localized mean just one area of the brain. So this is the area of the brain, and it's a, uh, the most frequent area of the brain for abnormal decreases due to traumatic brain injuries. Uh, and it's just because the way the corpus are shaped, it's shaped like a, like a long tree branch that grows down like a dew. And when you have a, a, a concussion, 
uh, that the bottom of you is the one that sucks the most shearing force. And so that's the area of the brain that's going to be uh, the, the most disrupted. And so this is the area that we see. Uh, in, but with an anoxic episode, you won't see it localized in that area. You would see it What is what is anoxic? Anoxic episode, like if you had cardiac arrest and you were without oxygen for a number of minutes, you could see this kind of decrease, but it would be throughout the whole brain, not just in this one area. Okay, so would, would we see the red everywhere? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and Dr. Carbon Zach happened in, in different ways. The person had a heart attack while walking, right? Yes, that's correct. It doesn't necessarily mean they fall over and pass out or a black out for 10 minutes. That's correct. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Yes. 
So you're very familiar, because you've worked in a forensic setting, with the term malingering, correct? Yes. And in short, malingering means faking or making up symptoms, correct? Yes. And wouldn't you agree in a forensic setting where you're going to come into court and the individual has an interest in what happens in the case, not a treatment interest, but an interest in the outcome, it's very important to determine whether or not the history you're being provided is accurate, correct? Uh, I would say it's important to try to get as accurate a history as possible, yes. And there are multiple instruments, psychological instruments, that are utilized to measure whether or not an individual is malingering or not. Uh, yes, there are malingering instruments. And in fact, uh, I think you referred to him earlier, Dr. Sesta, another one of the experts that was retained by the defense in this case, he had done some psychological testing to measure whether or not the defendant was malingering, correct? Yes. And in fact, he determined that the defendant was over-reporting or malingering symptoms, correct? Yes. To the point where Dr. Sesta's opinion was that he invalidated all the psychological symptomology that he was giving history of. Yes. So he was lying, so he couldn't be trusted. Yes. You've talked about TBI, traumatic brain injuries. Wouldn't you agree with me, doctor, that not everybody who suffers from a traumatic brain injury has impulse control issues? That's correct. So not everybody who suffers from a traumatic brain injury also goes on cocaine binges, correct? That's correct. And what you're describing to me here when you're talking about traumatic brain injury doesn't sound very traumatic. You're saying a simple fall off a bike, walking into a wall, everyday occurrences could cause this type of injury. Well, I would say that a simple fall off a bike uh, likely would, but it's possible, depending upon how one fell off the bike, that one could have sustained a traumatic brain injury. And it, there was also a car accident where the car was flipped, and that's uh, uh, compounded. Uh, and, and obviously, I don't know if it's as bad as in California as it is here in Florida, but there are car accidents every day that come to work, right? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Car accidents are infrequent events, correct? Yes. Not everybody who gets in a car accident becomes a pedophile, right? That's correct. Not everybody who gets in a car accident becomes a drug addict, right? That's correct. Okay. There are other factors, other conscious choices that are being made by individuals who suffer from traumatic brain injury. That's correct. Now, since you've never actually spoken to the defendant, um, you haven't actually learned from him what he did with the victim in this case on June 21st of 2013. That's correct. You don't know what was going through his mind because you've never asked him. That's correct. And since you've never spoken to him about the crime, <clears throat> You can't say whether or not his conduct was based upon the brain injuries that you testified here to today, or whether or not it was just his conscious decision to rape and murder that child. I can't say that he has profound neuroimaging abnormalities, and that these profound neuroimaging abnormalities, uh, in conjunction with uh, a history of being uh, molested and neglected, uh, increase the likelihood of a catastrophic failure in impulse control. I don't think you understood the question I asked you. Let me repeat it just to be sure. And oh, by the way, I asked you this question beforehand when you were under open deposition. Since you have never spoken to the defendant about what he did to that little girl on June 21st of 2013 and why he made those choices, you can't say whether it's a result of impulse control or whether or not he made a conscious decision to do those acts. Isn't that true? Uh, I, yes or no? So well, I'm, I'm trying to parse the question, see if I, I fully understand the implications. Uh, so, uh, uh, so you ask me whether or not, uh, since I haven't spoke to him, whether or not I can determine whether or not his uh, actions were a result of Impulse control failure or conscious decision, is that correct? Yes. Uh, I can't uh, directly answer that question. What's that answer? I can't directly answer that question. Well, you do remember giving a deposition in this case, don't you, sir? Uh, yes. 
Okay, and you were sworn to tell the truth, just like you were sworn to tell the truth here today. Yes. And I'm referring counsel to page 22, line 19. I asked you the following question. And actually, I thought I wrote it down exactly the same way I just asked you here today. Okay, but without speaking to him directly, specifically speaking to him about what led him to commit the offenses in this particular case, and you can't state whether or not his conduct was a symptomology of the brain abnormality you saw, or whether or not it was a conscious choice of the defendant. And your answer, under oath, during deposition was, yes, that's correct. Do you remember saying that? An objection, Your Honor, improper impeachment. If he's, if he's going to attempt to impeach, he should read the entire answer to that question. It wasn't just simply, a, yes, that's correct. Well, first of all, I would ask if you would show the question and answer to the witness to see if you recall <coughs> being asked that and answering the question. I'll show you, sir. That's first. Sure. 22, line 19. It's highlighted for your ease. That was the question, and that was your answer, wasn't it? I mean, when I say what that is correct, I can't state whether it was a conscious uh, decision or impulse control. And I, that's why I just stated here. So I don't see uh, what the contradiction is. Actually, I think you just said you couldn't answer my question. <clears throat> Madam Court Reporter, can we read back the uh, witness's response? Okay. From when you last asked him the question before you went to the deposition? Yes. It was before the objection, is that correct? Yes. Yes, it was. <coughs> Before he said he can't answer the question, or after that, there was some more. Do you want your question before he said I can't answer yes. that? If you would read Mr. Khalil's question before that answer. Question. I don't, I don't think you understood the question I asked you. Let me repeat it just to be sure. And then, by the way, I asked you this question before him when you were under oath in deposition. Since you have never spoken to the defendant about what he did to that little girl on June 21st of 2013 and why he made those choices, you can't say whether it's a result of impulse control or whether or not he made a conscious decision to do those acts. Isn't that true? Answer I. Question yes or no, sir. It's very easy. Answer I'm trying to parse your question and see if I fully understand the implications. So, so you're asking me whether or not, since I haven't spoken to him, whether I can determine whether or not his action was a result of impulse control by your conscious decision, is that correct? Question yes, answer. I can't directly answer that question. Thank you, sir. I don't have any further questions. All right, there's more to the answer that you wanted from the deposition um, published to the jury. Of course, Mr. Fletcher can do that now. <clears throat> Doctor, you were asked. Um, Doctor, were you were asked about the places that you're licensed and the places where you have testified, right? Yes. Um, where are you licensed? In California. And then that's where you live, right? That's correct. And how long have you lived in California? Uh, I would say since I was two, so 15 years. Okay. And does that in any way prohibit you from testifying all over, in anywhere else in the country? No, I testify frequently in, in multiple other states. All right, give us some examples of the types of cases you've testified other than in criminal cases. Oh, I've testified in a number of civil litigation in other states, uh, including uh, New York, uh, uh, Washington, uh, Florida, uh, Illinois. Okay, and in those cases, you are, you are offered as an expert. And, and for instance, you've heard me say, I tender this witness as an expert in this field, right? Yes. 
Um, and it's perfectly proper to be in a different state testifying as an expert, right? That's correct. Um, that nobody correct. requires that you have a license to practice medicine in Florida before you walk in this door, right? No, that's correct. Okay. In some of those other cases you have testified in, did they involve CTE? Yes. And, and did you have anything to do with, with the, the litigation that's going on in the NFL? Yeah, I, I've been involved with some of the uh, NFL football players have been involved in class action lawsuits. Okay. And that's taken you all over the country, right? Uh, yes. Okay. And that's because they have questions about the things that you are an expert in, right? Yes. Your education, everything you've done uh, as a professional for, for years and years and years have gotten you to that point that you're sought after by those people, right? Yes, I have a specialization in brain uh, imaging and advanced techniques. Okay. And you were asked about whether it was a conscious decision to do those things to cherish periwinkle or if it was impulse control, right? Yes. Okay. And, and the truth is, the answer is, it was a conscious decision, but it's influenced by the way his brain is structured. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sustain the objection. If you want to read his answer from the deposition, of course you may. Or you may ask him I'll a different to question. Um, if you can expand on that, can a person make a conscious decision to do something, but be influenced by how, how that person is built, so to speak? Yes, and it's clear that it, for an individual who has uh, certain fixations uh, that uh, they are struggling to uh, uh, deal with, and, and if that these uh, the impulse control system uh, is damaged, and this is going to impair the ability to curb those impulses. Uh, so, ultimately, at some point, it becomes a philosophical question uh, when damage to an impulse system and conscious choice comes into play. It, it, it's an area that uh, uh, is difficult to uh, draw a precise line in. I can say that he has damage to areas that regulate impulse control, that he has damage in terms of areas that regulate sexual object preference, that he has damage in terms of and that there are multiple abnormalities in conjunction with multiple stresses, which makes that impulse control even harder. Uh, but uh, you know, ultimately, I can't uh, make the final say. All I can say is that these are risk factors. It, it's kind of like uh, uh, if someone has a, a heart attack, if you have a uh, very high cholesterol, you smoke 30 pack years a day, you, you, have, uh, uh, you never exercise, you know, you're going to be, uh, you have family history, you're going to be at much higher risk for having a heart attack. But can I say precisely when uh, a person is going to have a heart attack? No, I can say that a person is going to be at much higher risk. Okay, and, and doctor, as far as obtaining medical records, if you're looking for medical records from when a 62-year-old was 9 years old, are those sometimes hard to find? Yes, medical records are oftentimes destroyed after seven years, and so it's oftentimes impossible to get earlier medical records. Now, the brain imaging clearly shows the kind of abnormality that would be consistent with that kind of history, because uh, the DTI decrease in FA, there's no way that that can be seen in a normal individual, but it's very common in individuals with multiple TBIs. And so, just because there's no medical record doesn't mean that the TBI didn't occur. As a matter of fact, the imaging shows that it very likely occurred. And if a person who is 62 now had a car accident when they were 20, those medical records, if there were medical records, <coughs> would be 40 years old. Right? Yes, and it would be almost impossible to get medical records that old uh, uh, in most cases. Thank you, sir. That's all <laughs> May this witness be excused? Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Wood. We appreciate your time. May call your next witness. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Joseph Sesta. Dr. Sesta. Thank you so much for coming. Testimony for the truth. All of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If you'll have a seat, I'll make this chair, please. May I please court? Sure. Good morning. Good morning. Can you please introduce yourself to the jury? Hey, I'm uh, Joseph John Sesta. Um, can you give us your educational background? Sure. I have a, I have a Bachelor of Science degree in uh, Psychology from Stetson University here in Florida. I have a Master of Science degree in Neuropsychology uh, from Drexel University in Philly. 
I have a PhD in neuropsychology, also from Drexel, uh, and I did a postdoctoral fellowship uh, in the Department of Neurology at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. I then did two more years of training in psychopharmacology, so I can practice medicine. I then did a one year of internship and one year of residency in criminal forensic psychology at the Forensic Service at Florida State Hospital, and then a year of residency in brain trauma uh, in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and, sir, are you licensed, are you licensed psychologist, neuropsychologist? I'm not licensed to practice psychology in Florida. I'm licensed to practice medicine in the state of Louisiana. And how does that work? In terms of the licensure? Yes. Well, I can, uh, sort of, kind of a hybrid. I do both things. In Florida here, uh, I'm a neuropsychologist. I predominantly uh, see folks uh, who have known or suspected neurological disease or brain injury and come in contact with the law. Uh, sometimes in the civil court system, folks are suing for money, get in a car accident, uh, some uh, chemical spill, and you get exposed to things. Uh, I see folks uh, who are involved with the civil court system. And then I do mostly uh, crimes that are punishable by life or imposition of the death penalty, uh, as well as death penalty appeals when the defendant uh, is thought to have some form of either neurological disease, uh, brain damage, or uh, perhaps some type of severe psychiatric disorder that requires uh, evaluation. In my Louisiana practice, it's a little simpler, pretty much practice psychiatric medicine. I see folks that come in uh, and I mostly prescribe medication for things like depression, anxiety, uh, bipolar disorders, insomnia. Uh, the, those are the big things that I see. So I have both a forensic practice here and a clinical practice in, in a Louisiana. And how often are you in Louisiana doing your clinical practice? The first, I, I drive up there, I don't fly. Unlike my colleagues, I'm afraid to fly. So I drive uh, from Florida to Louisiana the first full week of every month. Okay. And then the rest, of the, the rest of the time you devote to your practice? Right, the rest of the time I'm here in Florida. Okay. Um, and are you, in fact, board certified? I'm quadruple board certified. Okay, and what does that mean? Sure, uh, I'm, uh, I've been uh, peer reviewed and board certified in adult neuropsychology. Uh, I've been peer reviewed and board certified in pediatric neuropsychology. I've been peer reviewed and board certified in medical psychology. And then I have a subspecialty in forensic neuropsychology, which is the application of neuroscience uh, to legal proceedings such as this. And I'm not sure you've told us, how long have you been doing this? Uh, this is year 26 for me. So I had my, 20, my silver anniversary last year in September. This is my 26th year. Yes. And we've also heard from a neurologist. Right. Help us understand. Sure. Uh, a psycho well, we're, first of all, we're all uh, psychologists, and there's neuropsychologists and forensic psychologists. We all start out with sort of the same training, uh, and then we specialize uh, in different areas. Neuropsychologists are specially trained in evaluating and examining brain function. Particularly, uh, we're interested in cognition. That means thinking. We're interested in emotion and behavior, but we're interested in, in how it's related to diseases, illnesses, and injuries of the human brain as opposed to uh, childhood experiences uh, and things that other clinical psychologists might look at more than we do. Not to say that we completely ignore those things, but the focus of our, of our uh, scope of examination is more on how changes in brain function uh, have to do with changes in behavior and thinking and emotion. I have, right from the very start. Uh, the law started, I believe, the end of 99, and they uh, came and uh, uh, solicited me for the job uh, in 2000. And for two years, I was actually a part of the state of Florida's sexually violent predator program team. I was a community evaluator. I'd go out to prisons, uh, and I would see these gentlemen before they got out of prison to see uh, whether or not they should go out. Uh, and then I came and testified about it. And then since that time, I've been doing it in private practice since 2002. Right, so this is uh, my 18th year uh, doing sexually violent predator cases. So that's, that's something that you continue even up including today? I saw six 
uh, sexually violent predators last week uh, and the week before over at the uh, Florida Civil Commitment Center in Arcadia, Florida. So yes, I'm still very actively involved in this. And Your Honor, at this time I have a tender Dr. Joseph Sesta as an expert in neuropsychology as well as the um, sexually violent predator program in Florida. No objection, Your Honor. All right, he'll be entitled to uh, testify in that regard. And Dr. Sesta, I want to turn your attention to the case involving Mr. Donald Smith. Yes. You, in fact, um, have met with Mr. Smith, have you not? I have, yes. Okay, and was that as a result of a request for a neuropsychological examination? It was. And help us understand, again, what, number one, how much time do you end up spending with Mr. Smith? It's typically a full day. In this case, it took 5.3 hours. Uh, I don't break for lunch. We just bring lunch and spend the whole time with them. So it took almost five and a half hours to examine him. Okay. And is, how does this differ from just a psychological assessment? Yeah. Well, we uh, do more than talk to them, uh, and we don't give just psych we don't give ink blot tests or those type of things that you might typically think of with a psychological test. We basically this is taking the brain for a test drive. You just heard my colleagues testify about. You saw some pictures of the brain. If you think about an automotive analogy, uh, if you pop the hood and look at, look at the engine, that's kind of what the CAT scans and the MRIs and, and the fancy scans you saw let us do. But then if you're, sometimes you know you pop the hood, the car, and you look at the engine, everything looks okay, and it still doesn't run. So the neuropsychological examination, we sort of get in the car and take it for a test drive and find out what it can and can't do. Uh, we measure everything from how fast he can tap his fingers from his motor function to his sensory function, how well he can feel, to, the, to, to uh, his strength, uh, to his attention, his memory, uh, his uh, reasoning skills. Those are all measured. They're fed into a computer. Uh, the computer has a database of normal individuals who do not have any neurological disease or brain injury. And then we have about over 8,000 individuals with various forms of neurological disease, uh, dementia, stroke, uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, various neurological diseases. And the computer can tell us how do they do compared to the normal group. And if they're not normal, well, which which part of the abnormal group do they match best? Do they look more like dementia folks, brain injury folks? Who do they look like? So the computer helps with that as well. And that's what we do with the neuropsych. And we've had some um, prior cross-examination of doctors that talked about your assessment that Mr. Smith was malingering. Uh, for only the psychological part. That's about 15 minutes of the 5.3 hours. And, right. And if, if you can explain that, what was the 15-minute portion? Because, again, you were focusing solely on brain function. Sure. At the very end of an examination, uh, even when I know there will be other clinical psychologists uh, psychologist who are going to do a much uh, more in-depth assessment, I always give a brief uh, psychological exam. It's called the Symptom Checklist 90. It gives you 90 psychiatric symptoms and simply asks, do you have any of these? And if so, how often has this bothered you uh, during the past couple of weeks? And I can get an idea just to see if the person's in any acute distress uh, and is to, and to play off with my clinical examination. I also ask them questions, so it gives me some data on it. And again, that's at the very end of the exam. It's about 15 minutes. And yes, I didn't think that that was valid for Mr. Smith. But the other five hours where we looked at his brain function, uh, I did uh, over a dozen faking tests, and they were all clean. So there's uh, no evidence at all that he was attempting to uh, exaggerate or fabricate any neurological injury. And of course, we know that now because we have the scans, and the scans beautifully correlate with what I found. So there's no issue at all about faking the neurological component. I do agree that, that he's not valid or was faking the psychiatric complaints. Okay. And, and so let's get right down to it. In Based on your assessment, did you find brain impairment? Yes, I did. Okay. And, and help, us, help us understand, one, how do you determine that? Sure. We uh, looked at the, uh, the pattern of his responses. I compared him to a normal group of individuals and then looked at his pattern compared to normals. And I found that uh, he does not have uh, normal uh, brain functioning. We compared him to individuals who are his same age, who are his same gender, who are his same race, uh, and who has his same level of education, which is about ninth grade. So compared to people who are just like him, his brain doesn't function normally. And, and translate that for us in, in terms of what kind of behavior we expect to see. 
Well, it depends on what part of the brain is it working. That's the next question we ask. I think I, when I uh, uh, go over results with patients, the first thing everyone wants to know is, is there anything wrong with the way my brain's working? Well, if the answer to that is no, you go home and you're happy and we stop and there's nothing more to talk about. But if the answer is yes, hey. I'm sorry? Do you have such evaluations? I know that you've explained mm -hmm. that there's brain impairment with Mr. Smith, but in your, all of your experiences, have you done those kinds of assessments? And that's the answer to the first question, is there brain impairment? Has the answer been no? Oh, that's, that's really common. Those, those, are, those are the good ones. I get to give people good news that there's nothing, you know, you don't have Alzheimer's disease or you don't seem to have any after effects of this car accident. So yeah, there's lots of examinations where I don't find brain injury. And in criminal cases too, there's lots of examinations where actually defense lawyers sometimes want me to find brain injury and I'm like, there's just nothing there. Yeah, I, I asked for it. I mean, it was it's based on my examination. So if my exam had been normal, you don't follow uh, normal examinations with invasive, costly, and potentially dangerous examinations. And I'm sure you heard the PET scan. You have to get injected with a radioactive isotope. So we would never subject anyone to that if their examination was normal. You know, if your examination is abnormal, looks like you have abnormal brain function, then it's worth the risk to look further and. Most of the folks have uh, probably had friends or relatives or someone who's had CAT scans and PET scans. And the idea is if they have abnormal clinical findings, it's worth your risk to have a scan. Okay. So it, it, that's why you recommended that imaging studies be done in this particular case. Right. And also, uh, I wanted the PET scan. I wanted something function. And I also wanted uh, the opportunity to be proven wrong. Uh, what separates science uh, from religion and superstition is testability and falsifiability. We have to be able to test it and you have to be able to prove it false. So the question is, is you know, how would we prove this false? So I said, well, you know, my results look like there should be some damage or dysfunction to the frontal lobes. It looks like there should be some damage or dysfunction to the right side of the brain, the right cerebral hemisphere. Check it out, see if I'm right. I said, you know, use different doctors. Actually, we took two different specialties, neurology and neuropsychiatry. Uh, use different methods. Gosh, we, we had, this was the Cadillac here. We had uh, MRI, uh, we had PET scan, then we had the fancy versions of MRI. We had that DTI that you all saw, it looked like a pretty tree, kind of like a red tree that was probably lit up. Uh, and then we had the QVs, the, the, we, had, we had the quantitative volumetrics where they actually measured part of the brain. So this is, uh, this is, this is the Cadillac of workups that we've had here, and they correlated beautifully with what I found. And what does that mean? What well, there was, uh, uh, with, they get, uh, uh, I don't know, I wasn't here, I don't know what you heard, but I'm assuming that you saw some images that showed that there was something wrong with the frontal part of the brain. Uh, there was one part, that uh, DTI image, that tree that looked like it was lit up, there's like a whole big clump of the branches missing right on the front. That's something we don't see that much. That's kind of testing. I, I hope, I don't know when this is over, if I can get a copy of that for my students. But that's something we don't usually see. I'm sorry. Thank you. So there's like a tree, and there's a part of the branches missing right up there in the frontal lobe. Well, that's exactly what we, what we said should be true from the neuroscience to see was showing frontal lobe dysfunction. And I said, well, the right hemisphere doesn't look like it's working, as well as the left hemisphere. When they did the, uh, the, the QVs, the right hemisphere is atrophied. It's quite a bit smaller and, and reduced from the left hemisphere. So uh, the, the studies, the neuroimaging studies, validated what I found in my functional assessment of the brain. And what was your functional assessment of the brain? Uh, again, there's brain injury. The severity of the brain injury, I thought, was mild to moderate. Uh, in terms of what we call lateralization, left or right, I thought the right side of the brain was more impaired than the left. And then front and back, I thought the anterior, the front part of the brain, was more impaired than the back. Uh, then the question is, well, what's going on here? What did this? It's a little harder to answer. Uh, uh, I think you probably saw the QVs yesterday. That's the stuff that had, you saw red and blue stuff. And uh, I tell my students, blue big and red reduced. I don't know if they told you, but blue is things that are too big. Red are parts of the brain that were reduced or too small. Neither is good. The blue stuff 
the stuff that's too big is too big because when the brain has to connect two areas, it's really amazing. Whether you think this is the result of millions of years of evolution or whether you think that there's a divine creator who did it, but someone made a pretty amazing thing. So when the brain has to connect points A and B, if it wants a hundred connections, it'll send out a thousand to make sure it gets those hundred. But then later on in neurodevelopment around puberty, it has to go back and prune those extra connections that it doesn't need. And when that doesn't happen, you end up with those blue areas that you saw that are too big because the brain didn't go back and prune them down. And that's associated with the host of neurodevelopmental disorders. Then you have the red stuff. We teach our students, we tell them, dogs can have ticks and fleas. Look out for more than one thing being wrong. Uh, if, if the world was kind to us scientists, you could only have one thing wrong with you. If you had a stroke, that's the only thing you'd ever have. You never get dementia, you never have heart disease, you can only have one thing wrong with you. But that's not how it works. Uh, he has that neurodevelopmental stuff, the blue stuff. But then you saw all the red, stuff that was atrophied or too small. That's likely some type of neurodegenerative process. I talk with my colleagues about what we think it is. I think the neurologist thinks it's trauma, uh, uh, or uh, someone mentioned CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Maybe he's gotten conked in the head more times than we think he has. Uh, I'm not really, to be honest, well, to be honest, I'm under oath, it's great. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not really on the CTE uh, 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 train there. I don't think he's had enough blows to the head to really have chronic traumatic encephalopathy. He fell off a bike when he was a kid at nine. I've seen thousands of kids who've fallen off their bikes. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not ready to say that that causes a major brain injury. And a car accident that I never heard about that he apparently told one of the other doctors about, which again, I don't know about the severity, how bad it was, but there's just two things that CTE happens when you have the, you know, professional college football players in high school, you know, slapping their brains together again and again in practice, in, in, in ball games, again and again, you know, season after season, and we get this CTE. I just, in my experience, don't see that happening from two trivial head injuries. So, again, respectfully, I, I just disagree with that being a cause of injury there. Uh, and then, and then uh, so, I don't know. That's when, when you're a neuroscientist, that I tell my students to get used to saying, I don't know. Something's going on there. I agree it's neurodegenerative. It shouldn't be there. Uh, the scans are remarkable. Those big spaces of atrophy you saw where there's lots of water in the ground. Think of a beach. I'm from Tampa. When our hurricanes come through, when the beach recedes, like, well, the water comes in closer to the land. Well, that's what happens in the brain. When the brain recedes, the cerebral spinal fluid, the water, goes and gets bigger. So he has lots of big spots of cerebral spinal fluid water in his brain because the brain is pulling back or atrophying. And to be honest with you, I don't know why that's the case. Uh, sometimes our doctor phrases are the fullness of time, which means we don't know now, but uh, hopefully if things go on a little longer, maybe we can figure it out. So given the fullness of time, uh, maybe we'll be able to figure out what's happening and why Mr. Smith's brain is atrophying. But as I sit here right now under oath, I'm going to go with, I don't know, something's wrong with it, but I don't know exactly why. Uh, the neurodevelopmental stuff, I'm pretty sure of. Uh, um, he's hey, got... Dr. Sussex, do me a favor. Take a big breath. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's, let's go back, because you've given us a lot of, you've given us a lot of information. And your role in this process is to do that initial exam, to figure out, okay, should we go on with further imaging, correct? Yes. Okay. And we kind of got ahead of ourselves. What was it that led you to that conclusion? What was it about your examination? Uh, what I just described, that there was brain injury, uh, mostly in the frontal part of the brain and mostly in the right part of the brain, and then I wanted to further explore it, give someone the opportunity to prove me wrong, uh, and then uh, look for a correlation. Did the scans show what I found on my exam, and in fact they did. Okay. And that, that frontal, that, I guess it's the right hemisphere dysfunction, help us understand what that's going to indicate in terms of behavior. Sure. Real simple, uh, the left side of your brain activates your behavior. When you damage it, people look sort of like bumps on a log. They have the, the fancy name is abulia, but they don't move much. 
They don't talk much. They don't do much. They kind of sit there like bumps on a log. Uh, when the right side of your brain uh, is damaged, you look the opposite. You uh, have what they often call pseudo-psychopathy. You're uh, much more energetic. You talk more. Uh, you don't seem to uh, uh, have met much emotions. Things like empathy and compassion seem to be uh, missing. So there's a quite a different syndrome with him. So with his right hemisphere problems, We'd expect him to be sort of a cold, uh, emotionless uh, person who uh, may be sort of active or have a lot of uh, uh, activity uh, and just not a lot of ability to control his behavior. The biggest thing the right hemisphere does in cases like this that's relevant, it's the brakes. The front part of the brain and the, the right part of the hemisphere break behavior. The left hemisphere is the gas. So it, when you, it, it activates behavior. The right hemisphere is more like the brakes. It breaks behavior. So Mr. Smith is stepping on the gas. He has his left hemisphere works fine, but the brakes don't work well. And th therefore, things like anger, aggression, sexuality, in order for us to all live together in harmony, uh, we have to be able to put the brakes on behaviors that aren't socially appropriate. Uh, Mr. Smith has deficits in the parts of his brain that help him to break or control behavior. So, in, in essence, and, and I want to make sure that the jurors understand, you're not suggesting that Mr. Smith is not responsible for what he did on June 21st and 22nd of 2013. Absolutely not. I was asked to look at that. It's called an insanity defense. The fancy term is mental state at the time of the offense. And, uh, it's insanity defense to see if someone goes to a hospital and no, I didn't feel that at all. I think Mr. Smith is responsible for his behavior. I think he knew uh, what he was doing and I think he knew what he was doing was wrong. Uh, so I told you that I uh, could not uh, assist you with any type of insanity defense. But what you do have to explain for this jury in terms of mental mitigation is that he doesn't have this brain function that normal people have. Right, and that's, I think, if there's, uh, you know, anything in a horrible case like this that can, you know, help any of us sleep better at night is at some point you have to ask yourself in a case like this, you know, how does one human being do this to another? You know, and how do we sleep at night knowing this? Well, the only thing I can offer is his brain is, is certainly not normal. Uh, this is not someone who has a normal brain, and this is not what people with normal brains, you know, do. This is someone who has a lot of other, we haven't got there yet, but he has a lot of other things wrong with him. He's a pedophile, he's a psychopath, but then he also has this brain impairment, which uh, uh, prevents him from controlling his behavior the way the rest of us do uh, to live in society. So if there's one thing we can take away from this is, you know, you know no question, I think you've heard it probably from other doctors, that there's no question that Donald Smith does not have a normal human brain. Um, you were asked, you were provided materials in this case. A lot. Okay. And um, a lot of those materials um, involved Mr. Smith's <coughs> prior involvement with the SVP, or Jimmy Rice Law. Are you familiar with those documents? Yes. Okay. And if you can, because no one's really had your level of expertise, explain how the SVP law was created and how it was implemented. Sure. Just real quick, uh, the uh, sexually violent predator law is a post-conviction law, meaning uh, it, it's after the person commits a sexual offense and goes to prison and serves their time for their sex offense. Uh, before they get out of prison, we usually do it the, the last year that they're in prison, they'll get a visit uh, from two doctors. Uh, they're usually psychologists. They could be psychiatrists, sometimes one of each. There's two. Uh, and they examine them to determine a couple of things. It's pretty simple. One, do they have a mental abnormality? doesn't translate very well into science, but pretty much do they have anything wrong with, the, with them psychiatrically? Do they have a personality disorder? Do they have serious difficulty in controlling their behavior? And does this make them likely to engage in future acts of sexual violence if they're not uh, uh, committed for long-term care, control, and treatment? That's pretty much the elements of the act. And in, in fact, were you, uh, were you aware that Mr. Smith 
was in fact civilly committed in 2002, or uh, excuse me, 2000. Yeah, that's uh, sort of the added tragedy of this is that he was confined in a secured treatment facility potentially indefinitely and then let loose. Were you also aware that after he had gone out and committed other criminal acts and was re-sent to prison that a colleague had assessed him and determined that he did not meet criteria? Yes, I, I read that report. Um, what, having read that report, what, what can you say about that situation? Well, respectfully, the person's a friend and a colleague. Uh, I disagree. Uh, I think the pedophilia was strong. Uh, what struck me that I don't usually see in cases like this uh, is that one offense, and I, I'm, you know, I wasn't in the courtroom, but I don't know if you heard from this individual, but it was a little 13-year-old girl that, he, that got chased. And the report mostly portrayed Mr. Smith as a, an exposer, an exhibitionist, what you guys know as a flasher. These are called hands-off sex offenses. Some law enforcement call them nuisance sex offenses. No one wants to see anyone's penis, but it's you know. But given the the the, the things that can happen to you, that's probably not the worst thing. Okay, so that's what they thought was the case with Mr. Smith. But that one case where he's cruising the neighborhoods, you know, in this van, and he comes across this little girl, uh, and as his mo is, he tries to lure little girl into the van and he can't get her in the van. Now flashers are kind of used to this. I've seen hundreds of flashers. The flashers want two things. They want your reaction, what happens when they flash you, and how long they can hold your reaction. And the folks I've examined actually tell me they count when you're a kid, you know, one Mississippi, two Mississippi. They'll actually count in their head to see how long they can hold your attention before you either turn around, run away, etc. But they expect that to happen and they go on to the next person. Well, when Mr. Smith encounters this little girl and tries to lure her into the van, we're presuming he's going to flash her because we know he's flashed and masturbated to five and eight-year-old girls uh, before, earlier in his criminal career, and the girl runs. He doesn't just go on to the next person like flashers usually do. He's done something that's unique. Uh, I think I've seen almost 700 sexually violent predators in Florida in 17 years, but Mr. Smith gets out of the van and in something that's I mean, literally kind of out of every child's nightmare, he begins chasing her down the street and what I believe is broad daylight because she's a child, we don't think she's out at 2 o'clock in the morning, so he's chasing this child down the street. Uh, I believe if I read some of the reports say she's knocking on doors, she's trying to get help, and he's chasing this child down the street. Well, think, what's going to happen if he catches her? What is he going to do? How is this planned out in his head? Is he going to commit a sex offense right there in the park where she thankfully eludes him, hides, can't get away from him? Or is he going to drag her kicking and screaming in broad daylight back to the van? This offense, in my mind, is critical. If there's any example of a severe difficulty in behavioral control, this is the textbook definition of it. I don't know any other case of that's more clearly screams lack of behavioral control when you're literally chasing children down the street in broad daylight to take them back to your van. Uh, so this, in my mind, would have uh, really the strength of his pedophilia is great. I mean, he can't, I mean, we, we all, all day we see people we're sexually attracted to and we turn away, we go out about our business, but he could not disengage from this child. Uh, and to me, that would really drive home the pedophilia component. So I would disagree with my colleagues who didn't think that he was a pedophile. Of course, now, Monday morning quarterbacking, we really know that's true because of the offense that he committed, which of course the little girl was only eight years old. Uh, and uh, so I think that would have been, and then the, the, the sad part of this is, uh, my understanding from reading the reports and documents from the state attorney and, uh, is that he was let go because they didn't think they can prove something called the crane prong. 
And that's what we talked about, that serious difficulty in behavioral control. It's not enough just to be a pedophile, because pedophiles can often control their behavior. Uh, they don't have to offend against children. Uh, it's not enough to be a psychopath. Not all psychopaths kill people. Uh, they, be, they be mean people and nasty people and fire people and do bad things to people, but not all psychopaths kill people or rape people. So what was it diff they, the state didn't think that it could prove that serious difficulty in behavior control, but they never even looked. No neuropsychologist, neurologist, or neuropsychiatrist, or any of the folks you heard here testify today ever, ever saw Mr. Smith and did this type of examination. And what's sad is this wasn't hard to find, folks. You heard three different doctors using different methods. I went in there and tested him for five and a half hours. Some of my colleagues used, uh, I think Dr. Wu, he's the PET scan, the country's PET scan expert. I'm, he focused on the PET. I think Dr. Kalino focused more on the neuroquants, but three doctors three different specialties, a bunch of different methods, we all found the same thing because it wasn't hard to find. Uh, but you gotta look, and they didn't even look. And that, to me, is what separates this case from almost all the ones I've done before, is that we had them and we let them go because we didn't look, because if we did, it would have been easy to find. And this, I mean, I don't testify for the state a lot, but pedophilia, psychopath, brain damage. Folks, this is not a hard case to take before a jury. I mean, no one's gonna let this guy go when you lay out all those things. So that, to me, is what separates this case from anything I've ever seen in 17 years. Thank you, sir. I don't have any other questions. Any cross-examination? Yes, please. I guess it's good afternoon now, Doctor. It, three minutes ago, yes. <laughs> doctor, um, First, you commented on something, and I wanted to go back to that because before I forgot when it came to your direct examination. You said a car accident you never heard about. Yes. Okay. Now, you met with Mr. Smith on multiple occasions, correct? Once. One time, yes. five hours? 5.3 hours, yes. Okay. And part of that was to get as best of a history and then conduct these neurological testing that you've gone through? Yes. Okay. Uh, he told you about the bike accident, right? He did. He told me about the bike accident, age nine. Okay. And in your mind, it seemed pretty inconsequential. Yes. But flipping a car, hitting an oak tree on an orange picker road, that never came up, right? No, it did not. He never told you about that? No, he did not. Now, part of this testing, and I know, and I hate to put words in your mouth, but it seemed like you were trying to minimize it. Part of your testing, although it would be 15 minutes, was to look at psychological symptoms. And you tested him, and in 15 minutes, you were able to really determine that he's faking, right? Oh, yeah. It was gross. Uh, fakers don't often do a good job of faking. They overdo it. And this was a, a really grossly overdone faking. So it was, no, it wasn't hard to pick this out. Okay. I mean, to the point, it was so bad that it totally invalidated all the other psychological symptoms that he was telling you about. Everything on that test, yeah. I, I don't believe that Mr. Smith uh, has uh, really any of the psych, like depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, psychosis. I don't think he has any of those things. Okay. All those things that perhaps maybe other upon to determine that cocaine affected his brain at some function, such as hallucinations, delusions, things of that nature. Now, this is to make sure I understand your question. And cocaine is what we call a psychotomimic drug. It can make normal people crazy. So if, I don't know if, if he may have had those symptoms while high on cocaine, I'm talking about when I saw him in the jail that he was free of any psychiatric symptoms. Because when you're meeting with Mr. Smith, he has an interest in the outcome of this proceeding. And so people in a forensic setting, they lie because they want whoever's examining them to come to a conclusion that they want, correct? That's exactly the basis of millennial. Yeah, there has to be some external goal they want. In my civil cases, it's money. When someone, you, someone hits you and you, they want money. When I was with the Army, it was uh, uh, relieving of duty. They didn't want to go back to combat. 
Uh, and in these type of criminal cases, it's usually some type of decrease in criminal culpability and looking to get away with something or to lessen their sentence as well. So, yeah, I agree with you. So he lies to lessen the sentence. Gun want death, wants life, so he lies about it. At least in regard to his psychiatric symptoms. I just want to be really clear about separating the neurological from the psychiatric, but I agree with you in regard to the psychiatric symptoms, yes. Now, you talked about, and we discussed uh, the fact that you learned during the course of this case that at some point in time he actually tried to obtain the DSM. Can you explain to the jury what the DSM is? Uh, yes, but you, yes, and you told me that. Yeah. The DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Uh, it's sort of the Bible that shrinks use. Uh, I mean, psychiatrists, psychologists that have kind of, I guess, all the answers to uh, all the symptoms of the disorder. So if you were trying to fake a disorder, uh, this would be your Bible to guide you to what symptoms uh, you should produce. And you weren't surprised to learn that he tried to get this because I think you said it's prototypical sociopath. sociopath. Right. This is this is what. So, by the way, sociopath and psychopath mean the same thing. So you can take your pick. But yeah, this is what psychopaths do. They're manipulative. They're cunning. Uh, they're going to try to trick you and fool you. So no, I wasn't surprised that this is what Mr. Smith did. Now, the psychopaths. I think when we talked about it previously, you talked about it in two sort of forms: bad person, bad deeds. Right. Those are the two things that make up the uh, assessment for psychopathy. If you, uh, when you assess these people, the first uh, part of the examination has to do with uh, bad, being a bad person, uh, whether you uh, lack remorse, whether you lack empathy, whether you're compassionate. Oftentimes, I'll ask these people about their families, and I'm like, and they're in like, well, how old are your kids? They don't know. You're really close to your mom. How old is she? Where does she live? What's her phone number? And they can't tell you all these things. So, uh, and the second part is bad deeds. Well, what kind of things have you done? Have you been in trouble with the law? Uh, have you hurt people? Somebody asked them, what's the worst thing you ever did to anyone in your whole life? And, and, uh, and so get them to tell us about these things. So yeah, the psychopaths have both parts. They're, they have the bad person part, and then they have the bad deeds part. And if you have enough of both of them, your score is high enough that you're called a psychopath, and Mr. Smith most certainly uh, exceeds that threshold and would be considered a psychopath. So he's glib, he's smooth talking, disingenuous. Oh, yeah, he, he, he is. Uh, he, he's very fun. We sat there, it, it sounds odd, but we sat there in the jail and talked about books for a long time because I wanted to see how he interacted with people. And yeah, he's real charming, he, he's, he's well read. Uh, he's well spoken. Uh, I can I, give me a better idea of how, when he encountered the victim's mom, that he may have been able to cajole her because he really is a, a, you know, a, a, someone who can talk to you. And you already talked, he lacks remorse, he lacks empathy, the ability to share or understand other people's feelings. He lies, right? He, he does all those things, yes. He exaggerates, he fabricates, he deceives. That's what he does. That's what, it's like, yes, that's what he does. Now, I think you already told us about this, but on June 21st and 22nd, 2013, he knew what he was doing was wrong, but he chose to do it anyway. Yes, that's, that's my opinion. You, you talked about how he couldn't apply the brakes. Um, now, people who have this impulse control, they all don't act out in a sexually violent fashion. That's true. That's where the brain injury comes in and makes this picture a little different, right? If this was, it sounds strange to say, just a pedophile or just a psychopath, because those are clearly horrible things, but if he was just a psychopath or just a pedophile and had a normal brain, we'd expect that at least he, I say this in court a lot, at least the brakes would work. Whether or not he would choose to step on them would be a different story, but the brakes would work. Here, the brakes don't work very well. And so the brakes, talking about here because he's a pedophile is he was attracted to prepubescent children. In my mind there's no question about that. Yes. Uh, as young as as young as age five. And this lack of control just affected his ability to push down those deviant sexual impulses. <laughs> I'm not sure I know what you're asking, let me baby step into it and you can correct me if I'm getting it wrong. I think we use that gas and brake analogy. The pedophilia and the psychopathy 
were the gas. The, that was providing the, the, the drive that he had to, to sexually offend against children. But he didn't have the brakes on one side, so he had a foot on the gas real hard with that, with his pedophilic impulses and his psychopathic impulses. But there was no brake to oppose those behaviors. And as you saw, both with him chasing the children down the street and then with this offense against uh, uh, Cherish, uh, that there was this, this uh, inability to control his behavior. He was unable to control his desire to be with a child. Right, because I think his, his pedophilic urges are extremely strong. But in your opinion, that had nothing to do with killing him. Right, those were the separate, not all, and not all pedophiles uh, killed. In fact, it's pretty rare. Because uh, in this case, uh, again, this, I, as this is going to come out of my mouth, it's going to sound awkward to you because you don't do these cases. But for a pedophile to find a single mom with three children, if I'm correct, they were four, six, and eight. Those are all ages he's sexually attracted to. And a mom who's sort of willing to give him access to children, many pedophiles would have fostered this for years. Uh, but Mr. Smith uh, could not uh, get past that, that, that urge to act out immediately, and hence, I think his psychopathy, which made, uh, and his brain injury, uh, led to this uh, not just being a molestation, but actually being a sexual homicide. Well, but more importantly, it was your opinion that he killed her because he thought that he needed to avoid capture or he benefited by not having the victim alive. Oh sure, I, I, I agree with that. Yes, that, that's uh, again. He's a, I mean, he's he's not dumb, and obviously he's you know, thinking that if if you know, given again, I apologize. We have to talk about this stuff. But if you, I had to look through twelve hundred autopsy pictures. I don't know how many y'all had to suffer through, but it's, it's horrific. And, and to it, there's no way to in, to in, to impose that type of anatomical trauma to a little girl and then expect it to go undetected. This isn't, we have pedophiles who just fondle, they won't penetrate, they won't leave any, any evidence or damage, they can, they can keep doing it. You can't do what Mr. Smith did to cherish and expect it not to go unnoticed. So I agree with you. I think that after he had done what he did to her body, that the only thing that he could do would be, would be to take her life. To eliminate her as a witness. Absolutely. Thank you, Judge. Can I see the attorneys